The paper Tornado Automatic Generation of Proving Secure Mass Based Slice Implementations is a collaboration between Pere Raiz Dagan and Darius Mercadier from the Lib6, and Sonia Belay, Mathieu Riva, and myself, Raphael Winterzoff, from Crypto Experts. I will now present this work with the help of Darius. As you surely know, real world devices can leak some information about the operations they perform through their power consumption or electromagnetic leaks, for example. This leakage can be used sometimes with the help of statistical analysis in order to gain some knowledge about the secrets handled by the device. There are two main ways to deal with these attacks called side channel attacks. One solution would be to reduce the amount of information that leaks, and the other is to make sure the leakage is uncorrelated with the secret data. Masking is a common countermeasure of the latter category. In this talk, we will present Tornado, a tool to generate masked implementations from high-level specifications. Tornado takes as input some code written in a programming language called Usuba, which was designed to efficiently compile high-level specifications of ciphers on high-end x86 CPUs. Tornado compiles those high-level specifications into masked implementations in assembly for embedded devices. We'll start by talking about what masking is and why it is a useful countermeasure to side channel attacks, followed by the exposition of the two models of attackers that we use. We'll then explain how the tool works by first exposing the underlying security notions it relies on and explaining how detecting attack can be interpreted as a linear algebra problem that can be solved algorithmically. We'll finally describe how Tornado works and evaluate its performance on various ciphers. Masking aims at making the secrets uncorrelated with the leaked information. It consists in replacing every variable with sharings, which are tuples of shares chosen randomly except for the last one, such that they verify the completeness relationship, meaning that the value a sharing represents is equal to the sum of its shares for a given additive group law. Note that this completeness relationship implies that in order to get the value represented by a sharing, one needs all the shares, as any subset is indistinguishable from a random distribution. In the simple case of Boolean circuits, in order to mask an implementation, one also needs to redefine the operations so that they now work with sharings instead of Boolean variables. These new operations, called gadgets, can be seen as black boxes, taking sharings as input and outputting a sharing. In addition to that, we also define a special kind of gadget, called a refresh gadget, which aims at renewing the randomness of a sharing. In the first model we chose, the bit probing model, the adversary is allowed to place a certain number t of probes inside the circuit, meaning that he has access to the values of t chosen variables inside a masked Boolean circuit, possibly variables that are located inside gadgets. The property we want the circuits to achieve is tight t probing security. In other words, an attacker must not be able to retrieve any secret value with t probes inside a t plus 1 shared circuit a circuit where the length of the sharing is t plus 1. While this model is relevant in a hardware scenario, it is not enough when we consider mass software implementations, where variables are manipulated in registers in which all the bits leak together. We thus define the register probing model, where the attacker has access to the description of such a mass software implementation, in the form of a circuit composed of gadgets processing shares which are now vectors. Just as before, the attacker can choose t probes inside the t plus 1 shared circuit. They can now contain some new gadgets. More precisely, the gadgets we consider are addition and multiplication gadgets that perform the logical XOR and end gates, as well as rotation and shift gadgets plus refresh gadgets. In order to produce an algorithm that can verify whether a circuit is t probing secure, we first need to define the problem in mathematical terms. We do so by introducing a security game and reduce it to a linear algebra problem. In the game that corresponds to the t-probing security definition, the adversary chooses the inputs of a t plus 1 shared circuit and the placement of t-probes, and the simulator tries to simulate the distribution of the values of the probe variables without knowledge of the inputs. The circuit is t-probing secure if and only if both the adversary and the simulator output the same distribution. We then use a series of similar games that are all equivalent to one another, 
We won't go through these games in this talk, but let's see what happens in the last game. Since the multiplication and the refresh gadgets introduce some fresh randomness, we can consider their outputs as fresh new inputs. So the circuit can be transformed into a functionally equivalent one of multiplicative depth one. Also, in this last game, the adversary is only allowed to probe pairs of inputs of multiplication gadgets. That means that by placing one probe inside the multiplication gadget, the adversary can get one share of both inputs. This final game can be interpreted as a linear algebra problem. Since the multiplication depth of the circuit is 1, there are only linear operations, rotations and shifts before the multiplications. And thus, the coordinates of every share in the inputs of a multiplication gadget are linear combinations of the coordinates of the input shares. One probe on a pair of inputs of a multiplication gadget can be now be seen as a pair of matrices that we now call blocks. And the T-probing security is now equivalent to the following property. No matter how an adversary chooses the placement of T-probes and concatenates the two T-input blocks into T plus one matrices, the intersection of the images of these matrices must always be empty. In our example, by placing probes on the two rightmost multiplications, an adversary can get the two pairs of input blocks A, B and C, B3. As since C is the sum of A and B, and B3 is just B rotated by 3, it is possible to find a way to create three matrices whose images intersect. We can thus declare that the circuit is not tight T-probing secure for T equal 2. That attack will allow an attacker to retrieve the secret value of B entirely. In order to prevent this kind of attack from happening, one need to add a refresh gadget. Thanks to the linear algebra formulation, Verifying whether a circuit is tight T-proving secure for any value of T can be automated. This is what the tool called Typeproof Plus is made for. Given an unrolled version of an algorithm as input, it outputs whether a circuit is type-proving secure, as well as security proof. It does so by creating a directed acyclic graph for every input of multiplication gadgets, where the branches diverge when different input blocks are chosen for different potential attacks. Each node contains some information about how a potential attack could be made. Notably, it contains what we call a permissive attack span, which represents the intersection of the images of the matrices we are trying to construct to create an attack when we follow that path on the graph. We generate these graphs layer by layer until all the permissive attack spans are either empty or an attack is found. If no attack is found in all the graphs, then the circuit is tight to proving secure for any T and otherwise, it is possible to describe an attack explicitly thanks to the information contained within the graphs. In our example, let's describe what happens when the algorithm chooses B3 as the first probe input block. Also, let's not forget that this means that we can get C for free, since by probing the corresponding multiplication, an adversary can get both input blocks. The algorithm creates the graph for B3, and then proceeds to choose the next input block. As we've seen before, by choosing either A or B, an attacker can get both by probing the corresponding multiplication, and thus an attack is found. For the other input blocks, no, no attack is found. Note that the graph is not always of depth 2, its depth depends on the number of multiplication needed to create an attack. The goal of Typeproof Plus is not limited to verifying the security of circuits, it has another purpose, which is to protect circuits that are not T-proving secure. By adding refresh gadgets at carefully chosen locations in its own inputs until the circuit is deemed secure. To do so, it first analyzes the sub-circuits that appear frequently in the main circuit, because if a refresh gadget needs to be placed there, it will need to be placed every time this sub-circuit is called. Then, if there are still some probing attacks, the algorithm will refresh the operand that is present in the largest amount of attacks. This method is bound to eventually stop and yield a secure circuit but it is not guaranteed to find the optimal number of refresh gadgets needed to make the circuit secure. Finding this optimal placement of refresh gadget is left for future research. I will now let Darius continue the talk and tell you about how Tornado is built. Note that we have Typeproof Plus to verify the type of insecurity of a circuit in either the register or the bit plane model. We are interested in automating the generation of proof secure mask implementations. Those implementations will make use of a programming trick introduced by Biham and called B-slicing that I'm going to present in the next few slides. 
In the bit train model, type proof works only on Boolean circuits. To show what this implies, let's consider the example of a circuit that computes a left rotation on a 5 bit variable x and XORs the result with a 5 bit variable y. So I'm using 5 bit variables for simplicity, but of course, a real world cipher would rather use 32 or 64 bit variables. Since the variables are each 5 bits rather than booleans, type proof cannot analyze it in the bit ring model directly. Instead, we must expand each variable into 5 variables and expand each operator as well. The left rotation becomes a simple wiring, while the 5 bit XORs become 5 1 bit XORs. The code for this Boolean circuit can thus be written as 5 assignment and 5 XORs. We can then remove the temporary variables and we get the following program. Type proof can now be used to verify that the circuit is secure in the bit programming model. Well, actually, in this setting, both the bit programming and the register programming models are the same since each variable or register only contains a single bit. The issue with this representation, however, is the low performances in software. What was initially two operations, a rotation and XOR, is now five XORs. In a real life cipher, variables would probably be 32 or 64 bits rather than five, and you would then have to compute 32 or 64 XORs rather than one XOR and one rotation. In order to efficiently run the circuit in software, we can use a programming technique called bit slicing. The idea of bit slicing is to represent a n bit variable as one bit in n registers. If we take, for instance, one of the 5 bit variables of the previous example, we would need 5 registers to store it. If those registers are 32 bit wide, then there are 31 unused bits in each. The idea of bit slicing is to take subsequent independent inputs and store them in those registers in the same fashion. The second input would go into the bit of the second rank of the registers, the third input into the bit of the third rank, the fourth input into the fourth rank, and so on until the registers are full. Now, computing a bitwise operation between two registers, like XOR for instance, computes it as many times in parallel as there are bits in the registers. On 32 bit registers, that's 32 parallel XORs at once. So, recall the example of the previous slide, where one XOR and one rotation was transformed into five XORs. Well, executing those five XORs on bit slice data on 32 bit registers computes the circuit 32 times in parallel and is thus very efficient. However, still, bit slicing is somewhat limited. A 128 bit plain text becomes 128 registers, except that modern ARM CPUs only have 16 registers. Thus, bit slicing introduces a lot of peeling, which means that data are often moved back and forth between registers and memory, which is harmful to performances. End slicing is a generalization of bit slicing which reduces register pressure and thus usually yields better performances. In end slicing, instead of storing one bit in each register, several bits of the same inputs are stored in each register. For instance, a 64 bit input could be split as 16 bits in four registers. The remaining empty bits of the registers can still be filled with subsequent independent inputs. Applying a bitwise operation on those registers thus computes it 16 times per input for several inputs in parallel. Some ciphers naturally rely on this technique to compute their S-box in parallel, like Serpent, which represents its plain text as 4 times 32 bits and can thus compute 32 S-boxes in parallel for a single plain text. The register probing model is more realistic for end slicing, since it assumes that the probe can retrieve a whole register and thus gain information on multiple bits related to the same input at once. To analyze end slice code, we thus need the register probing model extension of TypeProof Plus. And we now arrive to Tornado. Tornado is a tool we developed to automatically generate bit sliced and end sliced mask implementations from Hadabad specifications. It is built from the Uzuba programming language, which already does automatic bit slicing and end slicing. We modified the Uzuba compiler to automatically mask ciphers as well and to use TypeProof Plus to make sure that the generated implementations are cheaper and secure. Tornado takes as input Uzuba code, so Uzuba is a high level programming language for cryptography. Here you can see, for instance, the Uzuba code corresponding to the example used earlier to another TypeProof Plus. This code is written as a node F, which takes 5 inputs on 32 bits and returns a single output on 32 bits as well. The first step of Tornado's pipeline is to use the Uzuba compiler to normalize this code down to Uzuba 0, a low-level subset of Uzuba. On this example, Tornado can either bit slice or end slice the code. Bit slicing would produce the following Uzuba 0 code. Uh, since it's quite unreadable and huge, we will instead focus on the end slice code, which does not require any transformation from the Uzuba source. Still, in Uzuba 0, equations are not nested, unlike in Uzuba, hence the few temporary variables here. Note that not every cipher is end by Tornado though. 
In particular, Tornado does not entice ciphers whose enticing implementations would require a lot of bit manipulations and thus be prohibitively expensive. This can be the case, for instance, of ciphers relying on lookup tables and which, unlike some other ciphers such as Serpent, did not anticipate the need to bit slice a lookup table. The next step is to send this USBA0 code to TypeOf Plus. The input syntax for TypeOf Plus is fairly close to USBA0, and this step is fairly straightforward. TypeOf Plus will then analyze the code and insert refreshes if necessary, and on this example, TypeOf Plus chooses to refresh T5 as you can see. The output of TypeOf Plus is then transformed back to USBA0 with the refreshes. As you can see, the USBA0 program now is the same as before, with just an additional refresh. Since TypeOf Plus can take a long time to verify a given program, there is a cache to avoid recomputing non results. The USBA0 code is then masked. This transformation is done by replacing each variable with an array of shares and replacing each operator with a masked gadget. For linear operations, the masked gadget is written directly in Uzuba as a loop, while for nonlinear operations and refreshes, it is written as a function call. We then have an optimization pass to speed up the performances of the generated code. For instance, loops used to compute masked linear operations are fused when possible. On this example, this optimization reduces the number of loops from 9 to 3, which is going to improve performances. Finally, the masked USBA0 code is compiled to C and then to assembly or binary using GCC. And we will now show some benchmarks, and I'll let Raphael present the verification parts of those benchmarks. We applied type of plus to implementations of 11 primitives used in the round 2 candidates for the NIST lightweight cryptography standardization chosen for their inherent ability to resist such an attacks or their ability to be easily masked. The order of magnitude for the time it takes to verify the security of such implementations in the bit probing model ranges from a few minutes to a few days. This disparity can be explained by the size of circuits and more importantly by the number of multiplications, but it is also caused by the linear relationships between the inputs of multiplication gadgets. Also, we can see with Pongens that the verification time does not increase linearly with a silent circuit. Even though we multiplied by 10 the number of multiplications, it took about 200 times longer to verify the security for 10 rounds of Pongens than for one round. In the bit probing case, no attack has been found on any implementation. This does not mean that no attack can exist in this model. It is indeed possible to handcraft some circuits that are not secure but large circuits tend to be secure in this model. Verifying security in the register probing model is usually faster than in the bit probing model case, as there are typically 32 or 64 times less multiplications to examine. Contrary to what happens in the bit probing model case, it is very easy even for large circuits to find flaws in the register probing model. This explains why we found attacks for the implementations of Clyde, Ace and Gimli. Our tool added to their circuit 6, 384 and 120 refresh gadgets respectively. For the first two circuits, this is proven to be optimal. As for Gimli, this has not been proven to be optimal. We wish to make it clear that attacks are dependent on implementations. So the ciphers are not fault here, but only our implementations of them. And now, Darius will end this talk by telling you about the performances of our tool. We benchmarked the implementation generated by Tornado for the aforementioned 11 NIST candidates in both bit sliced and end sliced modes. In this talk, though, we will only focus on the end sliced performances. Please have a look at the paper for the bit sliced benchmarks. We report in this chart the performances of each cipher in cycles on an ARM context M4 depending on the masking order. Note the logarithmic scale on the vertical axis. Without masking, performances range from barely more than 1000 cycles for Clyde and Ascom up to more than 10,000 cycles for Pijamask and Gift. At order 3, performances are between 30,000 and 300,000 cycles. At order 31, between 500,000 and 4.5 million cycles. And finally, at order 127, between 30 million and 300 million cycles. Tornado can thus reach very high masking order with decent performances. The only masked implementation we found in the NIST submissions was in the pyjama submission. And this implementation is about twice faster than the implementations generated by Tornado at any given order. Considering that this implementation was carefully untuned and is written in the mix of C and assembly, the performances of Tornado seem indeed reasonable for an automated tool. 
We observe that ciphers with a low number of multiplications perform better at higher masking order, which is to be expected since the cost of a multiplication is quadratic in the masking order, while the cost to mask a linear operation is linear. Pizza mask, for instance, is fairly slow when unmasked because of an expansive multiplication with a constant matrix. However, since it uses less multiplications than all other ciphers except Clyde, it overtakes them one after the other. At order 127, Pizza mask is thus the second fastest cipher. Similarly, at order 127, Clyde, with the lowest amount of multiplications, is more than 10 times faster than Ace, which has the most multiplications. The contributions we made in this work are threefold. First, we developed Tight Proof Plus, an extension of Tight Proof, which can prove the tight T proving security of a circuit in the register playing model, and insert refreshes to protect vulnerable circuits. Second, we combined Tight Proof Plus and Usupa into a tool named Tornado, which can automatically generate sliced mask implementations of ciphers from high level specifications. And finally, we evaluated Tornado on 11 candidates of the NIST Lightweight Cipher competition compared their performances and showed that three of our implementations needed additional refreshes to be secure in the register programming model. One of the areas of improvement of this work concerns the placement of the refreshes inserted by Type Proof Plus. Ideally, we would like to be able to show that the number of refreshes inserted by Tornado is minimal. Another area of improvement is the performances. We would like to improve the performances of the code generated in order to be as efficient as ancient implementations. Thank you for your attention.